Welcome to the third part of the introductory chapter into deep learning. So after discussing how to set up regression or classification and how to solve the optimization problem, we're now going to look at multi-layer perceptrons, dropout, residual connections, and so on. So this is really the first part that will allow you to then deal with tabular data in deep networks reasonably efficiently. And if tabular data is all that you ever have, you can probably fall asleep after this first lecture. Anyway, let's start with something very simple, namely learning XOR. And we know in XOR that only if one of the two input bits are true, then XOR is true, otherwise it's false. So one XOR one is zero. So it's clear that there is no way you can design a linear function that learns XOR. However, you can easily design a product function. So for instance, you can have you know, one classifier that you know, looks at the first feature and then one that looks at the second one. And then what you do is you go and take the product of them. And in other words, by computing the appropriate classifiers and then taking you know, their product, we can compute very efficiently XOR. So if you think about it, this goes beyond the simple perceptron that we looked at before, where we just had you know, a single layer, namely input goes to, through some nonlinearity, through some linear term and then a nonlinearity to get us an output. In this case, we need to post-process that output. Well, in other words, we take a simple multi-layer perceptron and if we attach another layer to it. Of course, there's some hyperparameters like how many hidden layer units sh should you have or how many layers per se you should have. But basically, short of that, you can now do a lot more complex nonlinear things by having a hidden layer. So in other words, you have an input X in Rn, you have some hidden weight matrix W1, and you have an output weight matrix W2. And so you have basically H is some nonlinearity of W1X plus B1, and then the output is W2H plus B. And conveniently, sigma is some element-wise nonlinear activation function. So the obvious question that arises is, well, why on earth do we need a nonlinear activation function? And mind you, this is a common mistake that one makes when implementing a neural network. You go and write your code, everything looks fine, and you run it, and it doesn't work. And then after a lot of debugging and some sheepish embarrassment, and I must admit it's happened to me too, more than once, you then realize, oh my God, I'm an idiot. I forgot to add the nonlinearity. It's a trivial mistake. Make sure you do that when you implement your code. Anyway, so why do we need that nonlinearity? Well, if we didn't have it, right, then you could write O is W2 times W1 times X plus B prime. You know, B prime is some function of W1 and B1 and B2. And, well, actually it's W2, B1 and B2. That's what gives you B prime. In any case, so you have a linear function. In other words, a linear function of a linear function is still linear. So now obviously the question arises, well, if that's the case, well, what kind of nonlinearity should you pick? And a really popular choice for a long time used to be a sigmoid. So you map the input into the interval 0, 1, for instance, by using 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. No, that, that's the trick. It's nonlinear and things work quite nicely. Um, alas, they work nicely after you've trained the network, but those networks are notoriously difficult to train. Why? Because you have gradients vanishing 
on either side of this nonlinearity. In other words, if the outputs are out of range, then things go bad. And there were plenty of cases where, for instance, Jan Le Guin talked about how to properly scale the activations in order to avoid this. Now, there's a very simple way how to fix this entirely. Namely, you take what's called a rectified linear unit. And some people would argue that this was one of the key innova innovations between Lunet and AlexNet. Um, and so basically the difference is that now there is one part where the gradient doesn't vanish. It still vanishes on the left-hand side, but no longer on the right-hand side. It also turns out to be faster and easier to compute, namely it's just the maximum between the value and zero. So if we want to do multi-class classification, well, we just take the inputs, hidden layers, outputs, and we're done, and we just put some softmax on top of it. Okay, so if we do that, well, maybe we can have multiple hidden layers. And indeed, you can have an input layer, a hidden layer, another hidden layer, another hidden layer, and then an output. Um, one important thing to note is that if I want to go, let's say, from four to two dimensions, you probably don't want to end up in a situation where you go from four dimensions to one and then you blow it up and then make it narrow again. Mind you, this is not an uncommon mistake, right? So it's not uncommon for beginners to, for instance, map from four dimensional inputs to a one dimensional output uh, to hidden layer to maybe another one dimensional hidden layer and then suddenly blow things up. So I've had cases where simply by removing a layer like this, the performance of the models improved significantly for homework submissions of students. So don't be that guy. Okay, so now there are a couple of tricks of the trade that you may want to incorporate into solving the deep learning problems. So you want to control capacity, for instance, number of hidden layers, for instance, also keeping parameters small, using dropout, maybe using batch normalization and residual connections, all of which help. And there's a big lot of such things. So a good thing also to get started in deep learning is you take a model that you know works and you modify and extend it, right? Because Usually those models have a lot of those tricks already incorporated. I'm going to go over them, but there is more to that. And you can, for instance, start with any of the example codes from the D12 chapters, and that will get you started quite nicely. Anyway, so here's the story. So the training error, as we already looked at, is basically the model error on the training data. And the generalization error is the model error on new data. Now, why are those things different? Well, you can easily imagine. Suppose you practice for a future exam with past exams. And if you do that very diligently, then at some point you're going to do really well on those past exams, right? So you can do that. And as long as you're dedicated enough, you will get somewhere nice. The problem is that depending on how you learned this, whether you memorized the answers or whether you tried to understand how the answers were obtained, well, you're going to do really poorly on the test, right? So if you just memorize things by rote learning, it's a terrible idea. I mean, okay, maybe not for the driver's license exam, but short of that for pretty much other, all other things. On the other hand, if you actually understand the reasons for a given answer, then you'll probably do well for new questions too. So what you effectively want is you want to get to a situation where the model capacity scales with the amount of data. If the problem is simple, then you probably should use a simple model. Whereas if the problem is complicated, then you should probably pick a complex problem. So if you look at the data to the right, well, if you look at those dots, there's no really way, good way of telling whether the truth is this black line or whether it's just a simple parabola. I would venture to guess that right now, a simple parabola that's shifted would do just fine 
but it could be that the black line is actually the truth. Right? But this is only something that would be justified if I had a lot more data. So probably you'd want to use a simple model here. Now, how do we actually get to robust models that are not too sensitive in terms of inputs? Because input sensitivity is probably a sign of overfitting. So let's look at this gentleman to the right and let's modify him a little bit. And even after doing all those things, well, that's still a star trooper, right? So a good model should be quite robust under modest changes in the input. And this is an old idea. So Tikhonov regularization, so this is from 1950, 1960, um, was proposed exactly for that. And there's a nice paper by Chris Bishop, which shows that Tikhonov regularization is equivalent to training with input noise. What then happened in the context of deep networks, this is Sutske et al, is that they said, well, okay, if those networks are really deep, then maybe we shouldn't only be injecting noise at the input layer, but also to the inside of the neural network. And so then the question is, you know, what kind of noise should you be injecting? So what you want is that the noise doesn't really change things in expectation, but it just adds some perturbations. In one way, you just set the terms to zero with some probability p, and you set them to xi over one minus p otherwise. So in expectation, xi and xi prime are the same, but of course, the latter has higher variance. Okay. And so what you then do is you basically, you know, apply the dropout as an extra layer. And this is equivalent to just nuking individual neurons in that neural network, and you pick different random neurons every time around. So this is how you make the model distribute its representation nicely over those neurons in such a way as to make it independent of individual neural activations, because any such activation can be dropped out. Of course, at test time, then you don't do that and things are okay, that makes it more resilient, but at training time, you just keep on destroying hidden neurons at random. Okay. Now, residual connections address another issue that's a very common problem in deep learning. So namely, which function do you consider simple? So one way to say is, well, a simple function is the function f of x equals zero. Okay, that's indeed a very simple function, but maybe it's a little bit too simple. And as a matter of fact, this function does something, namely it changes the input to something else. One alternative would be to say, well, let's assume that we don't want to change anything. So we just want to have g of x equals x. In that case, well, I could, for instance, parameterize x being transformed into x plus f of x such that if f of x equals zero, nothing happens. And if f of x is non-zero, then well, I can change things. This is called a residual connection. And it's a very common strategy to improve the accuracy of a model if I'm in a part of my deep network where I don't necessarily want to change the dimensionality of the representation. So this is really, really convenient in recurrent neural networks and in computer vision. But it's, you can use it otherwise for standard tabular data too. Last but not least, there's something called a batch norm. And basically what you want to do is you want to parameterize mean and variance of the layer separately. You estimate it per batch and this effectively acts as capacity control. The motivation of how this was introduced was entirely different as a means of covariative correction. Turns out that you can prove that it doesn't actually reduce covariative as a matter of fact, it can in some cases make it worse, but it turns out to work really well for capacity control. And thus, this is what people use. So you should just use that too. Okay, in summary, what you do is if you go from, you know, one layer to multiple layers, you get, you know, your deep networks and you want to alternate between a linear function and a linearity. 
In most cases, RHEL is your friend and capacity control is needed in order to prevent overfitting. So this way you can have a reasonable number of neurons and you just regularize them enough by having you know, small coefficients, have dropout, have batch norms, have other things. And then in combination, they control capacity quite well. There's a lot more content where this came from. So you should look at the multi-layer perceptrons chapter and this talks a little bit about dropout, weight decay, underfitting, overfitting, and how to actually design an MLP. So with that, we've come to the end of the first chapter of the crash course. And going forward, we'll now look at computer vision.